Okay, thank you everyone. Um, I'm Karthik Ramakrishnan. I am a professor of public policy at the University of California in Riverside. I also direct the Center for Social Innovation. Um, I am thrilled to uh, welcome California Common Cause, um, as well as uh, Professor Lauren Collingwood for this very special session uh, on redistrict, a workshop on redistricting in California, mapping demographics and the law. Um, first, I just wanna give some brief intros about our speakers. Jonathan Mehta Stein is the executive director of California Common Cause. Previously, Jonathan spent a number of years as the head of the voting rights and census program at Asian Law Caucus and as a voting rights attorney at the ACLU of California, where he worked to increase access to California's democracy for historically disenfranchised communities. Next, Lauren Collingwood is an associate professor of political science at the University of New Mexico. He serves as an expert witness in voting rights cases, most recently as an expert in NAACP v. East Ramapo Central District School District in New York State. Kiana Asamenfar is a program manager for California Common Cause. Kiana has led California Common Cause's election protection programs in four separate elections and currently leads California Common Cause's local redistricting work. And then finally, Dan Vicuña is Common Cause's national redistricting manager. He conducts research and provides legal communications and coalition support for Common Cause state organizations and their campaigns to implement redistricting reform. Please now to uh, turn it over to Jonathan Mehta Stein, who's uh, not only a colleague and partner on this workshop today, but in prior work that we've done with CSI when it came to vote by mail in California. Jonathan, welcome. Thank you so much, Karthik, and thank you everyone for joining us. I'm gonna share my screen now uh, and lead us through a primer on local redistricting law. Um, I wanna be clear uh, that there is a ton to know about local redistricting law in California. Um, and uh, we're gonna cover the highlights today, but, and we're happy to answer questions you may have um, over the course of today's presentation, but also feel free to follow up with us and we can help where possible. If you want to go more in depth, we would really recommend that you go to our hub of local redistricting resources, um, commoncause.org slash local redistricting 2021, uh, where you'll find information about uh, the law around redistricting, um, including a um, toolkit we're producing with the ACLU uh, that will be up at the later this month. Um, but you'll already find a wide range of resources that will be helpful to you. I want to be clear, I'm uh, not your attorney, uh, but I can be as helpful as possible in helping you understand this critically important area of law. All right, so let's get started. Um, first and foremost, we have to talk about um, population equality. The United States Constitution requires that political districts of the same type have the same number of residents. That means all city council districts in a city or all school board districts in a, sorry, all, uh, um, all county board of supervisor districts in a county need to have the same number of residents. The goal of population equality is to make sure that each legislator at any level represents the same number of people. So let's say in this instance, you have 20 uh, residents of the city and you have four council districts. You need to draw the district lines such that there are five people in each district in order to maintain population equality. Now, over time, of course, population shift, people die, babies are born. Frankly, gentrification and displacement happen and populations grow uneven. As a result, you have to, as populations grow, continuously redraw districts once per decade at least in order to make sure that you can rebalance your districts. That's called redistricting. So in this instance, we have some population growth in a particular part of town and those districts that were five residents each are now six residents each. Okay. Well, there's, it's really important to know that um, redistricting can be bad or good. Uh, bad redistricting can take away community voting power. In this particular hypothetical, we have a, um, a minority community. It doesn't matter what kind of minority community it is. It could be a language community. It could be a racial ethnic community. It could be um, a particular group of people who care about a, a environmental justice concern or land use issue. Um, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this exercise. This could be true for any minority group anywhere. You draw um, a relatively simple, straightforward set of districts that look like this. And despite the fact that you've drawn basic geometric shapes that people might think are sort of a natural shape for a political district, 
you've disenfranchised this community. They are one fourth of each of these districts and will not be able to elect a representative to city council in any one of the four districts. Now, by contrast, good redistricting can empower community and can enable representation. You take the exact same city with the exact same residential pattern, the exact same communities, you draw districts slightly differently. And now all of a sudden the minority community we we're talking about a moment ago, there are three quarters of one district and should have the opportunity to elect representation to their council and have a voice in local political affairs. Even if they can't elect representation, that's exactly what they want. They do have at least one city council member who has to be responsive to their needs and listen to them. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind redistricting and the way it can go well or go badly for our communities. Next, we're gonna talk about some terms that you need to know in order to understand redistricting law. So one term you've probably heard is racial gerrymandering. Racial gerrymandering is using redistricting to disenfranchise or minimize the voting power of communities of color. There are a number of ways you can do that, packing, cracking, and other mechanisms. Packing is when you uh, take a community of color and you put them as, you concentrate them as artificially into just one district or a small number of districts, so they have less political influence than they might otherwise. If a community of color could be 55% of two districts, and you draw district lines so that they are just 85% of one district and are able to elect representation in one district instead of two, that's called packing. Cracking by contrast is what I just illustrated in the diagram a moment ago. You take a community that could be the majority of a district or maybe multiple districts, and you, you disperse them so thinly across districts that they're not able to achieve representation anywhere. Now, the technical definition in Supreme Court case law says that racial gerrymandering occurs when race is the predominant factor in the drawing of district lines. Race can be considered in the drawing of district lines. And in fact, I would argue it has to be considered in the drawing of district lines. It simply cannot be the predominant factor in drawing district lines. To do so would be illegal under Supreme Court case law. Now, you may have also heard of partisan gerrymandering which is using redistricting to disenfranchise or minimize the power of an opposing political party. You can do this in the same way that you could do racial gerrymandering, packing, cracking, and other mechanisms. This is illegal under California state law, both at the state level and at the local level. There's a third kind of uh, uh, incumbency, there's a third kind of redistricting shenanigans, um, not quite as pernicious perhaps as racial gerrymandering or partisan gerrymandering, but still really problematic, and it's using redistricting to um, protect people in power. Uh, this is unfortunately legal and the examples are everywhere. So I'm gonna give you a really quick and maybe fun example. Um, this is Bobby Rush. Bobby Rush was the co-founder of the Illinois Black Panther Party in the 1960s. He became Congressman from Illinois District One in 1992. In 2000, he was challenged in the congressional primary by a young Illinois state senator uh, Rush crushed that Illinois state senator in the congressional primary, but he didn't want to run against him again. Redistricting happened after the 2000 election and, and before the 2002 election. So Rush had the opportunity to redraw district lines to make sure that he could prevent that challenger from challenging him again. Who was that challenger? It was Barack Obama. And what did Illinois District 1 look like after redistricting? It looked like this. It barely skirted Barack Obama's house, so Bobby Rush wouldn't have to face him again. Bobby Rush remains the only person that has ever defeated Barack Obama in an election, and he still represents Illinois District 1 to this day. So what has California done to address partisan gerrymandering, racial gerrymandering, and incumbency protection? It has passed a variety of laws to make redistricting more fair, more independent and more community centered. And we're gonna talk about some of that today. The main law that you need to know is the Fair Maps Act, AB 849, authored by assembly member, uh, then assembly member Rob Bonta, now our attorney general in California. Um, and it does a couple things. The first is it, it codifies what we call, what I call first order requirements, your top level requirements from federal law. Um, it, it states that all local jurisdictions have to comply with the constitutional requirement of substantial equality of population and uh, comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act of 1965. We're gonna go deeper into each of those in just one second. It then also states that cities and counties have to comply with a longer list of requirements once they've maintained 
population equality. And once they've complied with the Federal Voting Rights Act, if it's applicable, they have to then comply with these criteria in ranked order. And we're going to go deeper into these as well. Okay, so substantial equality of population. Um, all districts, this means essentially that all districts within a local jurisdiction have to have substantially equal numbers of residents. Now, why am I not saying that all local districts need to have exactly equal numbers of residents? The reason why is because courts understand that in order to achieve all the things we're trying to achieve when drawing re districts, right? We're trying to honor communities where they live on the ground. We're trying to draw districts that are compact and easily understandable and contiguous. We're going to talk about all of those things in just a few minutes. There's lots of priorities you're trying to achieve. It's basically impossible to draw districts with exactly the same number of people. Well, it's not basically impossible. It can be done. But if you want to honor a variety of other criteria and other priorities, it can be hard. So how much wiggle room is allowed exactly? This is maybe more detail than you need to know. But what the law says is that the difference between the largest and smallest districts can be 10% of the population. So they have to be substantially equal, not exactly equal. Now, when you're thinking about equality of population in these districts, you're thinking about total population. What I mean by that is you count everybody to, make, to determine whether there is an equal population. You don't just count voters. You don't just count registered voters. You don't just count U.S. citizens. You count everybody because everybody deserves and needs representation. And last note here on substantial equality of population, prison gerrymandering is prohibited by state law. What that means is that folks who are incarcerated are not counted in the small rural town out, you know, toward the Sierras or whatever, where they are incarcerated. You count folks where they lived before their incarceration. So um, it's just one more detail. If you're going to get into mapping, there's one more detail to know about e population equality. And this is the reason why you need to use, when drawing district lines, state-adjusted census data and not just census data. We can talk more about that in question and answer if people want to dive further. Okay, next, you have to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act. Now, in order to um, understand what's required in the Federal Voting Rights Act, you need to ask a series of questions that come from a Supreme Court case called Thornburg v. Jingles. And there, um, Lauren is going to be coming up in just a few minutes, and he's going to dive deeper into this. But here's what the series of questions essentially is. Is a minority community geographically, this is a uh, Asian Americans, uh, Latinos, um, it, it's a racial minority group, uh, Black voters, of course, a racial minority group. If a minority community is geographically compact, is a minority community geographically compact enough that it could be the majority of a hypothetical city council district or school board district or county board of supervisors district? Okay, if that minority community politically cohesive, do they tend to vote in a similar way? Do they all vote in a similar way most of the time? Then does majority block voting, does a politically cohesive majority vote in the opposite direction so as to usually defeat the preferences of the minority community, thus denying the minority community representation? And then lastly, has the minority community faced historic or present day discrimination? Now, again, Lauren's going to go over this more, and there are um, resources on our website that can get dive into this further. Uh, so you don't need to memorize this all now. But really, the answer, the quite, what you need to know is that the answer is, to all of those questions is yes, then the hypothetical district in which the minority community could be the majority of eligible voters must be drawn. That's known as a majority minority district or a section two district. Because the provision of law that mandates this is Section 2 of the Federal Voting Rights Act of 1965. So I just flew through a massive body of law, um, and we can talk more about it later. But these are the general principles you need to know around the Federal Voting Rights Act. Now, because I'm talking about the Federal Voting Rights Act, you might be thinking to yourself, do I need to know the California Voting Rights Act for the purposes of redistricting? And the answer is no. The California Voting Rights Act, as some of you may know, is a law in California that enables you to move a jurisdiction using at-large elections to district elections under specific circumstances. But because it applies to at-large jurisdictions, it is not relevant for redistricting, which is, of course, a process that is only undertaken by jurisdictions that are already using district elections. All right. So uh, those are the federal laws that you need to know. Next, I'm going to turn to the state law, um, again, AB 849, the Fair Maps Act, and the line drawing criteria it provides in ranked order. 
So it is most important that local jurisdictions comply with number one here, then number two here, then number three here. And as I'll talk about earlier, when you get down to the bottom of the list, they comply with number five, for example, only to the extent that they can without contradicting or conflicting with the criteria that come earlier. So I really want to emphasize that these are ranked criteria. Okay, so state law criteria number one is contiguity. What does contiguity mean? It means that districts must be contiguous. They must have one unbroken line that traces the border of the district. So the district on the left, which has a gap, that's not allowed. The district on the right, that's contiguous. Okay, so that's an easy one. Gets harder from here. State law criteria number two, keeping neighborhoods and communities of interest whole. We're going to talk a lot about communities of interest today and over the next year together. Um, you know what a neighborhood is, but what is a community of interest? A community of interest is, this is from the state law, a population that shares common social or economic interests that should be included within a single district for the purposes of its effective and fair representation. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, cool, you just read me a portion of the state elections code, like, but what are we actually talking about? In easier to understand terms, maybe, I hope, a community of interest is a group or a network of people that share, it doesn't matter, interests, views, culture, history, identity, language, values. Here are some elements that you might think about when you are defining your local communities of interest. A community of interest might share interest in a school district or good schools for kids, housing issues and, and more affordable housing, crime, transit, health conditions, environmental use, uh, oh, sorry, land use or environmental justice. Um, or a community of interest might be centered around common social or civic networks um, like churches, temples, nonprofit groups, service providers, community centers. Um, they might be a group of people who share a racial or an ethnic identity, share a language, um, share a historical cultural identity. Or a community of interest might be people who share socioeconomic status relating to income or home ownership or education levels. Or it could be a combination of those things, right? Um, it might be, for example, um, the portion of town that is disconnected from the rest of the town by a major highway and suffers from lower property values and a lack of services from, from the city. That could be a community of interest. Or it could be a portion of the county that has a highly rural lifestyle or agricultural economy distinct from this county's population centers. That could be a community of interest. The communities of interest in each city or county are defined on the ground by the residents. There is no one black and white, simple or concrete answer to what a community of interest is. Okay, so what does it mean to keep communities of interest together? It means that if you know what your communities are, they should be kept whole within one district so that they can join together and speak with one voice. Here's an example of what it would look like to violate state criteria number two. This is the city of Martinez. It wanted to draw four districts so that each council member was in a different district and could run for re-election. And so doing, they drew these long, skinny, ribbon-like districts that cut up neighborhoods and communities. So if there's a Latinx community or a Black community somewhere in the city of Martinez, it's now sliced in half and it has less power to influence anyone council member or less ability to elect the council member of choice. Okay, so let's keep moving. State law criteria number three says that counties need to keep cities and census designated places whole, okay? So if you're a county doing your redistricting process, uh, let's say you're Alameda County, you want to avoid slicing the city of Fremont into multiple pieces if you can, okay? Um, obviously this only applies at the county level. Here's an example of Fremont um, in which I would, I, oh, sorry, no, this is an example of um, uh, an example that would violate the state criteria. It's actually not from a county redistricting, it's from an old state redistricting. In 2001, the state legislature drew its own district lines, and in order to protect incumbents, it sliced Watts into three different congressional districts. Um, this is the sort of thing the state criteria is trying to avoid because later in the decade when crisis hit Watts, it was unable to find an advocate in the congressional delegation. It wasn't able to find an audience with anyone because every congressional representative said, you're someone else's problem. And of course, this is layered on top of historic disenfranchisement and underinvestment based on race and class. So this isn't just about district lines, but it's an important part of the story. So state criteria three, that is trying to keep cities whole, 
um, in county redistricting is meant to avoid situations like this. Okay. State criteria number four. District lines should follow uh, natural and man-made boundaries. Districts should be easily identifiable and understandable to residents. And to the extent practical, they should be bound by natural and artificial barriers. That means district boundaries should use, oops, hold on a second, should use like a major thoroughfare or a highway or a bridge or a river. These things are sort of natural barriers or boundaries. And to the extent practical, and to the extent that you're not violating the other criteria ranked higher, you should use them as district boundaries in the redistricting process. Here's an example, this is from Fremont, in which you see sort of a jagged edge between districts two and three. And that would suggest that they're not following the state law criteria number four. Now, I wanna be clear, this happened before the, the, the Fair Maps Act passed. And so them using this as a hypothetical, I'm not suggesting that Fremont did or didn't violate state law. Now, you might think to yourself that jagged line dividing section, uh, district two and section three, district three, that doesn't follow natural and man-made barriers. There are bigger streets you could have used to draw the boundary between District 2 and District 3. In reality, District 2 was home to an Afghan cultural and commercial hub with Afghan nonprofits, Afghan businesses, Afghan places of worship. And they drew that district line in that weird jagged fashion so as to include Afghan population centers, apartment complexes with large populations of the Afghan community in the same district as the Afghan cultural and community centers. So that's an instance in which they were drawing lines that honored communities on the ground, upholding communities of interest, and they had to subjugate this criteria around following natural and man-made boundaries in order to do it. And that's fine because communities of interest is ranked higher than this, this criteria, criteria number four. Okay, and then last, last on the list is um, state criteria number five, compactness. To the extent practical, practicable, and where it does not conflict with the preceding criteria in the subdivision, geographic uh, uh, council districts should be drawn to encourage geographical compactness. What I want to emphasize is not so much what does geographical compactness mean, but what I want to emphasize is that this comes last. Why? Here's the thing. Have you ever seen or been part of a community that organized its homes and its residences like this? No, I promise you, you haven't. Have you ever been part of a community that organized its homes or its residences like this? Again, no, I promise you, you haven't. Communities on the ground, honoring communities on the ground, keeping neighborhoods together, keeping communities of interest intact, that's the purpose of redistricting. And guess what? Communities don't live in simple geometric shapes. And that's why compactness, having these simple, easy to understand, compact districts is the last criteria on the list. It's more important that we honor communities or comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act, for example, than draw simple geometric shapes um, that, uh, that are compact and easy to digest, easy on the eye, so to speak. All right, some additional legal details that I need to really emphasize before I wrap up. The federal criteria that I've mentioned, substantial equality of population and compliance with the Federal Voting Rights Act, those apply to all jurisdictions at all levels. They apply to our congressional redistricting, our state redistricting, and all local redistricting, okay? The state criteria that I mentioned, coming from the Fair Maps Act, AB 849, they apply to counties and general law cities. They also apply to charter cities unless the charter city has taken action to identify its own redistricting criteria in its city charter. And lastly, those state criteria from the Fair Maps Act that I just mentioned, right, compactness, contiguity, uh, keeping communities of interest whole, and so on, they are discretionary for school districts, special districts, and community college districts. School districts, special districts, and community college districts really need to comply with the federal criteria, substantial equality of population, and the Federal Voting Rights Act, and they choose whether they comply with the state level criteria that I mentioned earlier. For more information, I recognize we just flew through a very busy, very difficult, very deep area of law in 20 minutes. Um, for, there are, there's, um, there's, there's more to learn. And also, there are legal requirements around process, around outreach, around language access, and there are best practices on these things. Um, if you want to know about those legal requirements okay, around process, 
outreach, language access, disability access, and so on, go to our website, our hub of local redistricting resources, commoncause.org slash local redistricting 2021, and you will find a variety of other resources that illuminate more of redistricting law in California. Thanks Great. so much. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, there's a lot that was packed in there. We have multiple questions for people asking if they could see the slides and we'll have the slides as well as the recording to share later. Uh, next, we have Lauren Collingwood. Lauren. All right, so that was an excellent presentation. I'm Lauren Collingwood from University of New Mexico. Partly I'm involved with this because I was previously an associate professor at uh, University of California, Riverside. So I'm working in that area still. Um, so uh, Jonathan did go over racially polarized voting a bit already. I'm going to present a little bit more on the kind of data statistics side a little bit towards the end. But just to recap again, uh, there's a ver variety of ways to cut it, but it's really quite simple. Uh, voters of one race uh, or ethnicity back one set of candidates and then voters of another race or ethnicity back another set of candidates. So typically, uh, as, a, as an outside expert or an analyst, I'm coming in to investigate whether whites or Anglos are voting one way generally for a slate of candidates over a series of elections, say you might look at five to six different elections, and uh, uh, Blacks or Hispanics or another uh, racial minority population is voting another way. Sometimes if it's a large district, say like Los Angeles, you may be examining uh, racially polarized voting across a, a wide a, array of um, minority populations and Anglo voters. In other cases, in smaller jurisdictions, it's say only Latinos you're particularly interested in, and then uh, uh, whites you're also, or Anglos you're particularly interested in. Now, it's important to keep in mind um, that when we say RPV, if ra racially polarized voting exists, it doesn't necessarily mean um, that voters are racist per se. Uh, we, we can't really say that given the data, but given the uh, purview of the Voting Rights Act and particularly the jingles uh, test, uh, we are able to measure outcomes of voting. So uh, this group of voters is voting for this set of candidates. This other set of voters is voting for this other set of candidates. We can look at these patterns and determine whether patterns exist based on race or ethnicity. And so just to uh, re review this again, uh, the Thornburg versus Jingles case, which was upheld by SCOTUS in 1986, established a three-pronged test. And so much of the time that when we come in to work on these cases, there is not necessarily debate on threshold uh, jingles test, uh, test one, where um, minority group is sufficiently large enough or geographically compact enough to be able to ensure to draw its district. Um, in the case that I was most recently working on, we were looking at an at-large situation, an at-large school board election where um, basically everybody had to run across the entire district in order to get elected. And it was clear our expert side, the other opposing expert side, both agreed that uh, Blacks and Hispanics in combination would form at least one district. Number two, minor minority voters are politically cohesive. They tend to be voting together in support of a certain set of candidates. Here, it's really important to keep in mind, say um, the, the minority population we're looking at in, in a particular case is African-Americans it doesn't necessarily mean that they're always voting for African-American candidates. It tends to be that way, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. Okay, so that's really important to know under this. And then finally, number three, um, majority voters, often whites, um, are, are voting in a block and they're effectively defeating the minority uh, candidates preferred, uh, minority voters preferred candidates. So you often run into a situation where there's eight districts or eight seats and all of the seats are controlled by the white uh, population. Maybe all eight of the elected officials are white, but yet uh, the minority population in the jurisdiction is say 37%, 42%. This is probably pretty common across California, especially with demographic change. So how are we gonna measure this? Again, this is a little bit in the weeds here, but just to kind of give you a sense on this as you go through, understanding racially polarized voting is really, really important. Um, it can vary in degree of intensity. You know, intensity technically you could have 51% of this one group going this way, 51% going another way, but typically you're seeing things above 60% one way or the other. A very clear example of racially polarized voting is the state of Mississippi, where whites are voting generally 88% plus for one candidate 
and African Americans are voting 90% plus for the opposing candidates. That's the most clear example, right, that you're going to tend to see. Your vote is secret. Most of the time we don't have public opinion data, so we have to gather precinct level voting data or ecological unit data usually is what we're using. Uh, we're gathering data in a variety of formats, but usually that data is publicly available from the County Board of Elections. And then we're also gathering racial demographics, either from the US Census, American Community Survey, or what my colleagues and I have begun to do is include voter files from the, uh, fr from the, the, the jurisdiction that you're looking at. So we developed our software package. If some of you are familiar, again, this is going to be a bit beyond, uh, but this is some stuff that I've spent the last year or two working or three or four years working on this, where we can gather voter file information. We, because California, for example, race is not necessarily on the voter file, but we can use a surname and a geocode location. We geocode the data. We get the latitude, longitude coordinates. We then can make an estimate as to your race and then we can collapse that into the precinct, and then we can bring that on with the voting data, and we can use that to improve our ecological estimates. Okay, so that wraps up my time. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you, Lauren. Next, we have Kiana from California Common Coast. Great, thanks, Karthik. Um, hi everyone, I'm Kiana with California Common Cause. Um, so the first part of our presentation focused a bit about um, redistricting law and the legal requirements relating to state and local redistricting. Um, in this portion, my colleague Dan and I are going to cover a little bit about some of the tools that are available to community groups and members of the public to engage in their redistricting process. So Jonathan shared a bit about communities of interest, which are required rank, ranked criteria in the redistricting process. Um, and this is an area where the state citizens redistricting commission, uh, cities and counties, local jurisdictions are going to be seeking community input um, on what those communities of interest are. Um, communities of interest are defined by the community members that live inside them. So it's really up to you about how you want to define your community, how you want to explain it to your commission or local government, um, and how you want to organize your community. Um, to kind of rally to, to make sure that your, your community is preserved in, this, in your state and local maps. Um, so I'm going to share one of the tools that are available um, for you all to use in describing your community of interest. I'm just going to share my screen here. So this is a tool called Draw My CA Community. It was created by the statewide database to enable members of the public to submit a community of interest map to the state Re citizens redistricting commission for them to consider in their creation of their maps. Um, so this is an opportunity where you can kind of provide uh, feedback on your community to provide the commission building blocks for their maps. Um, so to access it, you visit drawmycacommunity.org. We can paste the link in the chat shortly um, and you'll access this website. And so this is an opportunity for you to directly tell the State Citizens Redistricting Commission what they need to know about your community. Um, we'll go over how you can describe your community, how you can draw your community on a map, and how you can submit directly to the commission. Um, so we're gonna walk you through a tutorial now, but there also is a tutorial available on the website for you to go through. Um, there are two options when, when you uh, go on the website. One is to log in. You can create a, a login with your email and a password. Um, this is a good option because it allows you to create multiple drafts um, for you to revisit over time. Um, and you can kind of keep track of the maps that you've created. Um, but you also have the opportunity to continue as a guest. So I'm going to log in um, with my account. And you'll see here the, the platform is offered in multiple languages. Um, so as you'll see here, these are some drafts that I've been able to create on the platform. And here you'll see submissions if you've already submitted something to the commission. So what we're going to do today is start a new map. And as you'll see, it's the state of California. You can see the boundaries. Um, indicated by these gold lines. And you have the ability to customize how you see this map in a number of ways. The first is kind of the base map style. So you can use topography, a simple black and white, 
um, visual, or you can go with terrain, which I like, which kind of allows you to uh, easily see some landmarks similarly to what you'd see on Google Maps when using the tool. Um, you can also choose a drawing layer. Right now we see the, the boundaries uh, of counties indicated. As we zoom in, it automatically changes its drawing layer to uh, be more and more narrow. So as we zoom in, we can see cities and towns. If we zoom in further, we can see census tracts. And then if we zoom in even further than that, we can see census blocks. If you want to adjust the boundaries that you're seeing, you can change it from default and customize um, the, the drawing layer that you want to see. And some of these aren't available until you zoom in even further uh, on a more micro level to see, um, to see um, these various drawing layers. So if we want to create a map of our community of interest, we can use this platform to select parts of our community and submit it to the commission. Um, so if let's zoom in a little bit further. So again, we're looking at census tracts here. So these are some of the drawing tools that you can use to create your community of interest map. Right now, we're just on the move map feature, which allows me to move, move around by clicking my mouse. If we wanted to create um, a map, we can add census tracts by clicking within these boundaries. And the more I click, the more I add to my koi map. We can also add by rectangle. If I select this option, I can draw a rectangle and add more to my koi map. We can also add by freehand, and that's I could draw a shape like this and select all of the areas that were um, within that boundary and add it to my koi map. If I wanted to remove an area, I could use this eraser function and remove specific census tracts. Um, if I wanted to get even further down on a more micro level, I could zoom in a bit. Now we're on the census block level and I can subtract blocks from um, my koi map. So we're going to do a quick example here of, of what you might do if you wanted to submit a COI map to the State Redistricting Commission. So the first part that's required is to give your community a name. Here we are in the Koreatown area in Los Angeles. So I'm going to say Koreatown commuters, for example. Um, and then these are the two required portions. You, you include a description about what your community of um, interest is. So as Jonathan covered, um, again, communities of interest are defined by the community. It could be a common language that you share. It could be a common activity, um, a, a, a common industry that everyone in your community works in. Um, it can be a number of things, and it's really up to you what that community of interest is. Um, for example, here we can say Koreatown residents who commute to downtown Los Angeles um, using metro, bus, and subway services, for example. And we can say um, all the members of this community um, go to the church on Wilshire Boulevard. And you can add more to your description um, in, this, in this box, or you can specify more about whether there are certain neighboring communities that you would encourage the commission to include and preserve within your district, or whether your community is distinctly different from nearby communities that um, you don't necessarily want to be um, included in a district with. And you can say more about that here. So once we're done describing our community, we can draw it again. Let's narrow this down a little bit. If I wanted to remove from my map, I could also use this rectangular feature to remove that. If I zoom in, let's just say um, we wanted to add some of these blocks together. And let's say that's my koi map. Um, so once we're done, we can submit. It allows you to review before you submit. You review the description and, and the map that you've selected. You have the option to um, indicate your name, email, and phone number. Um, and then you just acknowledge that your map will be sent to the State Redistricting Commission. And you can also opt in to receive updates from them. And once you do all that, you can submit and it will be sent directly to the State Citizens Redistricting Commission. Um, so let's go back for a moment. Um, 
you also have the option to export your map. So let's say you're done submitting your map to the commission and you want to share your submission with um, an, another member of your community. You have the option to export your map, um, PDF or shapefile. Sorry, let's go back for one moment. Let's leave this page. Okay, here we are. So let's select this one, for example. Let's say we wanna export this map that we made earlier. You can export here. You should have three options. You can export by PDF, shapefile, or equivalency file. Um, and you can download that. You can share that with a member of your community for their reference. Um, let's go ahead and download that here. And this will generate a PDF that you can share. And we'll, it will also issue a submission ID. Once you submit your map, um, it will have a unique ID here and you can share that with members of, of your community. And they can write to the State Redistricting Commission saying, I'm in support of the COI map with this specific submission ID number. Um, and they can express support for the map that you've submitted to the commission, or they can go into the tool and draw their own map and submit it um, to the commission. And, and you see here, here is kind of the description that you submitted to the commission. Um, for folks who are also looking to engage in local redistricting, you can use the COI map that you've created um, on this platform, download it, share it with your local city and county, for example. It's possible that the COI map that you submit to the state might be different from what you might want your city or county to consider. So in that case, um, you have the option of using Districter, which is a tool that Dan is going to cover, um, or a platform that your city or county offers members of the public to use to submit their feedback. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it to Dan, who's going to share more about Districter. Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining. Um, let me start to share my screen here. Um, so as Kiana mentioned, um, I'm gonna take a few minutes to just demonstrate free mapping software uh, called Districter, um, which you can find here at uh, districter.org. Uh, this was created by the talented uh, team at Tufts University as part of the metric geometry and gerrymandering group. Um, so let's sort of dive in here. Uh, when you when you first arrive at the website, you can see you've got uh, information. Uh, you scroll down here on all 50 states. Uh, so we're going to go to California. Um, and as you can see on this page, uh, you you know have the option of either drawing districts or drawing communities. The district drawing map is great. Uh, we're, however, we're going to focus on um, the community drawing communities. Um, so click here and use them doing census block groups. Uh, to show you the program's bells and whistles, I'm going to use a community that I'm familiar with um, as an example. Uh, so I'm going to start um, as this thing loads here. I'm going to type in um, South Pasadena, California. Come down here. Um, you know, the interface is pretty similar to GPS programs. You know, you'll be familiar with Google Maps, Apple Maps. So, you know, I typed in a city to kind of get to where I want to go, but it's also got uh, addresses you can go straight to, you know, a bunch of landmarks, you know, again, kind of very similar uh, to uh, Google Maps. Um, so, you know, we tend to envision a community mapping session starting with the identification of, uh, you know, certain landmarks. Um, so let's uh, let's kind of imagine that what I'm coming up with comes out of a robust discussion among several people uh, kind of attending a session. Um, <clears throat> so in, in South Pass here, I'm going to start by identifying identifying a nearby um, metro station. You know, it's sort of a, an important um, commuter location. So we'll, let's, let's pretend that sort of the group decided that this was really an important uh, spot in the community. So we all plug in South Pasadena Metro and then you go, go down and see Metro Rail, um, South Pasadena Station. Um, what you can do once you've located the spot you're looking for, you can then mark it. You go down to the bottom right hand corner here for important places, uh, click on that and you can just drop a, drop a mark right here on the Metro. Uh, you can um, scroll down, make sure you're going to the, the point itself uh, and you can name that new point. Metro, and then uh, below you can kind of describe decision makers if you know if you're going to send this link directly. Um, you know what does that make this location important? So you know important commuter commuters. 
you know, there's also a farmer's market at that location, uh, um, sort of music festival, you know, when you're also, you know, that's an annual music festival, when you're actually kind of doing this description, you can sort of do a very kind of narrative style, um, make, make sure folks know why this location is kind of important to the community. Um, you know, I think, you know, in a, in a real kind of community mapping session, you, you might have agreement on a bunch of, a bunch of different locations. So just for uh, kind of example purposes, I'll, I'll just do a couple more. Um, so you, you know, depending on the group you've got uh, together, they may think that, uh, you know, you have the local public library is a really important spot. So you might come down here, you know, look up South Pasadena Library, you know, kind of mark that here. You can, again, you can name it, describe why it's important. Um, other, uh, other folks may kind of think of park space. That's important to keep in their community and ensure that there's uh, sort of uh, good protection over. So we'll, you know, we'll also drop a mark <coughs> over here at uh, Garfield Park. Again, you can name it down here, describe why it's important to the community, you know, big gathering spot for, uh, for kids and families. There's playground, there's also a uh, recreational uh, activity, tennis courts and things. So um, uh, again, so in a community mapping session, it could be just a bunch of locations that you find to be kind of important uh, to the, the group as a whole, but we'll, we'll sort of stop there for the sake of brevity. Um, so what we'll do now is click on the block groups that correspond with the locations we've chosen. And that's kind of, we found that to be kind of a, a useful starting point. Um, so what we'll do is move over to the painting function on the top, uh, top right here. Um, you can do different brush sizes. Uh, you know, the larger brush sizes are useful maybe for drawing districts on the other side of the app. Um, but for something as granular as community mapping, the really smaller brush size is useful. Um, so we'll start by marking off, like I said, just the, the, the census block groups that correspond to the locations we've marked as like a starting point. And the park is up here. Um, you know, I think there's sort of likely to be a robust discussion about whether some of the spaces between the block groups kind of also make up the community you're drawing. So imagine, you know, kind of a, a conversation where you're saying, oh, you know, in this, this space, there's a lot of kind of businesses and restaurants. That's actually the case. So I would say that's part of the core of the community. Um, up above here, this is sort of a lot where a lot of folks who actually walk into town into those important spots um, that they live. Um, so that's, you know, so we'll say, and then you have agreement that this is our community. This is sort of um, South pa Central South Pasadena, it's a little bit of a mouthful, but uh, you'll want to mark that here, down here in the plate, uh, I'm sorry, up in the uh, community area, sorry, and so where you're naming and describing the community as a whole. Then, you know, then you can give kind of qualitative description of why it's important to keep it together. And they can describe, type in here about how, you know, it's a very walkable community, um, uh, you know, racially diverse, and we really want to keep it together to ensure that these important places we've marked uh, are, <coughs> are kind of protected by state and local government. Um, another function you can use, you can kind of change the colors up. If you, you know, as part of the discussion, you may find that um, you're identifying areas that are adjacent or nearby that maybe are, but are kind of distinct in terms of their character. So, you know, the, the community group might say, well, you know, kind of north of the 110, you know, it's more residential. Folks are a little more uh, maybe connected with the city of Pasadena up to the north. So we'll mark this and you can kind of mark that as an entirely separate community, you know, name it here and provide a description as well. Um, once you've kind of laid out your communities, you have some tools for evaluating what you've created. Um, data layers here that you can you can add in, or maybe community sort of county boundaries. This is sort of a really small area, so you're, you're gonna, it's going to fall within the counties. But um, some other places you can build in, we can ask the team to to look at and add in for you. Um, you can also look at kind of racial demographics. Um, you can show different populations. Uh, using either shaded regions or kind of dots. So shade, you know, there might be that shaded regions. It can be a little tough to see uh, when you're doing the painting. So you can really switch that over to size circles. Uh, you can also look at possible coalitions. Uh, where do both you know, Latino and Asian Americans live in the community and change that over to showing the population, the coalition population to see where both live and kind of see some, some dots there a little bit. Uh, voting age population as well. Um, finally, kind of, you know, the, another evaluation you can do here on this tab is comparing the demographics of the community you've created 
uh, with the state as a whole. So there's the central South Pass area we created, and you can also pull down that community too in the yellow to see how that compares. Um, finally, uh, you can take a look at some tools to use to kind of share what you've done, to export it, uh, to collaborate with others. Um, if you click on the share button up here, uh, it creates a unique URL uh, that this one right here that your work that you've done so far has been saved uh, at that URL. Um, you can send this to other folks, uh, then they'll kind of be at the same starting point as your if they build on that make edits make changes. Uh, it'll create a new URL so that your original work um, is saved. Uh, if you connect with uh, we can help you connect with the team, the developers of the website, um, you want to make sure that you keep work done at different community mapping sessions, keep it organized, keep it together. You can create a, a tag or event code uh, for the group that's come together. We'll say it's like, you know, the one cause. This so Dan, is. we're gonna have to wrap up in a minute. All right, thanks. Um, or add a team, so this might be Team South Pasadena. So um, that's, and then finally, the way you can export uh, this information is either you can you sort of print it as a PDF, or send it out as a, a variety of different sort of uh, mapping files, uh, depending on who the audience is. So uh, it's a great tool. It's free. You can play around with it right now without much trouble at distro.org. And um, uh, yeah, so that's about it. Great. Uh, thank you, Dan. If you could stop your screen share and if everyone else can turn on your cameras, I'm just going to read through um, some of the questions um, that, have, um, that have come up and trying to bunch them. Uh, as much as possible. Uh, some of these, uh, so some of them, uh, granted, we're not, uh, uh, you know, legal experts as much on this call, but that said, well, actually, we do have some legal experts on this call, so well, let's see, let's see where we roll with this. In terms of uh, charter cities, which, how should we be thinking about charter cities, um, you know, versus, um, versus general law? Uh, charter cities, uh, you need to go to your charter city's charter uh, and identify if they have um, registration criteria uh, stated there. Um, and then the ABA 49 says basically if they have two or more criteria stated uh, or they state that their criteria must be used and no other criteria can be used, then those criteria in the city charter hold. If they don't have anything in their city charter, then the, requ the requirements and the criteria of ABA 49 apply. Great. One question that just came in is in terms of the timing of when people generate these tools. So is there a certain time window that people should be uh, ready? Can, can they basically do practice work now and then the actual submissions occur later? Yeah, the practice work can be done now. I mean, I think the organizing can be done now. We're starting to, you know, in a bunch of different states, could sort of train the trainers to get people ready to go out and do community mapping sessions, you know, and, and which, you know, the community mapping doesn't require any census data, you know, where it's just mapping the boundaries of where you live. So yeah, I can start now. Great. Um, so people were asking about the difference between um, state versus local um, drawing and if there can be kind of clarification about the kind of tools, whether they, they vary or not. Um, as well as anything else they should be thinking about. Um, I think a bunch of organizations will be probably involved simultaneously in both. So any tips there? Yeah, so the Draw My California Community tool was created specifically um, for the state redistricting process. And that's why there's a built-in feature um, to submit directly to the State Citizens Redistricting Commission. I think if folks are using that um, to create their COI map to submit on the state level and feel like the core that they've created kind of reflects their interests and preferences to be used on the state, or I'm sorry, on the city and, and county um, level, then I would recommend that you just go ahead and download that um, and share that with your local jurisdiction. Although I know a number of cities and counties are using Districter or um, perhaps a, another public mapping tool. And so I'd look into you know what, what the city or county is offering and whether there's an easy way to transfer what you created for the state level to your local government. Great. Uh, people want to know in terms of, um, you know, when they draw these maps about the kinds of demographic information that will be included. I imagine also, I mean, this will depend on when, you know, say timing of the demographic information as it exists now versus when the redistricting 
data are out. There was also another question about thinking about the 2010 COI uh, maps. Is there any institutional memory here where people can see what was done before? The only caveat I would say that folks is that populations move, right? To Jonathan's earliest point. So even if there were particular neighborhoods that were trying to be preserved because we need to equalize population, it might be complicated. But any thoughts on that in terms of population characteristics and any kind of other references that people can use to orient themselves? Uh, so the the team at Tufts will be you know uploading you know population data to district as soon as it comes from the Census Bureau, either kind of in a raw form, maybe over the summer, or a more refined form as the states get it. You know, at the end of September, September thirtieth is when the Census Bureau's announced they're they're likely to get population data out. So I, you know, I, and I'm sure that it's the case for you know the other tools as well, where the the folks who are who design them are going to try to you know, put that in as soon as possible so that you can, uh, you know, do the district mapping using updated data. Great. Um, question for Lauren, can ecological inference be done with CVAP block group estimates and block group level voting data converted from precincts if the voter file isn't accessible? Yeah, that's uh, the, the more common way is to use uh, CVAP, CVAP block group data, or you can use VAP in this case, maybe um, it's not as much of an issue. You could use VAP uh, at the block level. But keep in mind when you're using block group data, the spatial join uh, from the uh, CVAP shapefile to the precinct shapefile can create uh, some, some significant outliers at times. So it's sometimes very difficult and or expensive to get voter file data. Um, and you do have to have some technological capacity in this area, um, but it is it can be uh, perfectly legitimate to use CVAP data and or VAP data uh, at those uh, appropriate levels. Okay, one question was, uh, you know, as we're waiting for the redistrict file to come down, what is the data that's being pulled right now? Is it the ACS? And if so, is it the latest five-year ACS? Do folks know from the maps that were just demoed? You know, it depends on the jurisdiction. You, you, there's a place that you can actually check that on the website. I just forgot to see where, what what the latest is. It, yeah, it depends on the jurisdiction. Some of it is ACS, some of it's just 2010 10 census, but I, I'd have to look. Okay, wow, okay. Um, all right, so we have about a couple of minutes left. Um, you know, few people are asking for this to be shared. We're gonna share this on our uh, blog, both the, um, the slide decks that were shared as well as uh, the video link. and. We'll work with California Common Cause to make sure that's also on their website and cross-referenced. Um, folks, were, so in terms of, uh, I guess one final question on this on local redistricting, can you please confirm that you can use the statewide database tool or is redistrictor preferable? Kiana, you wanna go? Um, yeah, so again, I think if you're uh, using Draw My CA community to submit a coin map on the state level, you can download and, and share it and use it on the local level if you want. Um, but if you're if you're not submitting on the state level, I think it, it might be best just um, use Districtor um, and its functionalities to create a, a local coin. So one question that came up is in terms of um, Black immigrant communities as opposed to African American communities. Um, will these data allow to look at nativity differences by, by race? Or would people, I mean, I, I'm gonna go off in that question, or will people need to basically look elsewhere to figure out what those characteristics look like? I think it's just race data, right folks? I don't think it's race by nativity in terms of the data that are being pulled with these tools. So anyway, we'll, we'll investigate and get back to you all on that. Right. Great, okay. Well, um, I'm just gonna toss it back to you, Jonathan and the team at California Common Cause. First of all, thank you so much. We had incredible interest. Um, and uh, we know that once we archive this, that there, you know, it's gonna continue to be a resource um, as we work our way through the summer, making sure that we're prepared and ready and the, and the mad dash sprint that's gonna occur in the fall. Uh, on multiple fronts. Uh, so Jonathan, any uh, any final closing thoughts from you and the rest of the team, feel free to weigh in as well. Yeah, I'll, 
Thanks, Karthik, and thank you to the CSI team. I, I, thank you, everyone, for joining us. The thing, only thing I'll say is that because of the delay in census data um, for the redistricting process, all of us, I encourage you to think of it as a gift of several extra months where we can get organized together as a community, meet your neighbors, meet your community organizers, uh, determine are you going to get involved in the city level, the county level, the state level, or on the federal congressional districts, um, and begin to make plans, experiment with these tools, read up on the resources and the law. Um, you have uh, extra time to really prepare yourself um, and, and, and build bonds with your community members so you can advocate together. Great. Kiana and Dan, any thoughts? Um, no, just to build on that, we just relaunched our local redistricting 2021 uh, website yesterday. I know we talked a lot about uh, communities of interest today. We actually have a template to help you kind of prepare your testimony on the state and local level. So really encourage folks to check those resources out and looking forward to working with everyone during this redistricting cycle. Yeah, I'll just say, you know, the technology to do nefarious things with redistricting has improved, but so is the technology to do good. So uh, yeah, definitely uh, please do get involved. Data for good, Lauren, any final thoughts before we close? No, I'm good. Hit me up if you have any questions about the work that I'm doing here. Thank you. Excellent. And thank you to Eric and Paula uh, who helped organize uh, to make sure this went off seamlessly. Thanks again, everyone. And I uh, look forward to continuing to partner with you in many ways.